everybody. It is Thursday, 6.30, uh, which means it's time for our Facebook Live. We're just going to give a few moments for everyone to join us. Um, excited about today's show. I'm going to go through our typical outline, uh, and then we'll get started in just a few seconds, okay? All right, so tonight, normally we do a lot of uh, Facebook uh, Live updates on the laws, on whether it's immigration or personal injury, car accidents. But every now and then, we like to bring other members of the team. I know you guys don't want to just see me every week. So we want to get to know everyone else who's working hard on your cases in our office. And there's many things uh, that people do behind the scenes. And it's really important for you all to know who is working on your case, their background and their education. And that's what the Meet the Team series is all about. Some quick updates. In addition to that, we're going to start having client testimonials uh, or uh, even clients on the show to help other potential people explain what the process was like for them. So if you're a former client and you think that's something you want to do, please let us know. We have some people saying hi. Uh, hey, Miss Lillian, how are you doing? And then Mr. Bashar. It's good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us. And really quick, uh, besides that, you know, we like to always start with something positive and some good news. Yesterday, we received a uh, word that one of our clients that's been waiting probably six or seven years for their citizenship was approved. Uh, his case was a very complicated one. Uh, a lot of things happen outside of his control and he will now be a citizen at the end of this month. So we are happy for him. Uh, and I know that I just spoke to him on the today and he is uh, through the moon as well. So if you don't already, please follow us on social media. Uh, we are at Mubarak Law for Facebook and as well as on YouTube and Instagram or Twitter. And we even have a newsletter. So everyone's always asking us what's the best way to get updates, what's the fastest way. Uh, we always send out newsletters or updates, especially when something happens breaking and is so critical. So I'm going to bring on our guest. Uh, I just want I'd like to introduce her. Uh, there's a couple more comments. Lillian saying Gloria is the best. I agree. Gloria is wonderful. She has been with me for nine years. So God bless her. Uh, and uh, and uh, Mr. Mohammed just joined. Hey, Mohammed, welcome. Thanks for having us, guys. Um, in your living room or on your wherever you are tonight. So our new attorney, attorney Rushni Ravani, is a individual born in India. And then after uh, reaching a certain age, her family moved to London. And then in London, she became a solicitor, which is the equivalent to an attorney here in the United States. And she said, you know, that's not enough. Now I want to go to school again and, and become a lawyer in the United States. Uh, but besides that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about her background information because she is impressive for a U.S. attorney. Uh, she graduated in the top 6% of her class. Uh, she graduated with honors in London. And uh, her family also had a firm. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on uh, attorney Rushni Ravani and please uh, say hello, send us your questions, and please let's give a big welcome to uh, attorney Ravani. Hello, good evening, Nayef. Hey, how are you? Good, thank you for having me. It's my oh, first it's my ever Facebook Live, so yay. <laughs> welcome to Mubarak Law, welcome to Facebook Live. Uh, you know, this is going to be a great um, uh, start for you, and I, I could tell you that I already feel so comfortable and I'm very thankful that you've joined our firm. Uh, you're doing a great job. So we'll start with that uh, at that point. And uh, my dad says I'm looking great. So hey, dad. Thank you. Um, so Rushni, tell us uh, a little bit about, you know, living in India and, and where, where you're from. So um, as you mentioned, um, I, was, uh, I was born in India, uh, in a city called Anand in Gujarat. So I'm a Gujarati. Um, for people who don't know, Gujarat is in the west of India. It's, it's, and there's a lot of Gujaratis out there. Everybody kind of knows one or the other Patel. So, so we come, I come from that state. Um, and then um, my family, my dad was a, a lawyer um, in India. He had his own firm. My mom, she used to work uh, in a bank. She was a cashier in a bank. 
And um, we lived in India. I did my high school in India. And then um, I was there until I was 16 years old. So my my family, my dad decided that um, we were going to um, immigrate to United Kingdom. So that's that's that. And that's how my journey began in United Kingdom. OK, so we have some people uh, saying hello to you. Uh, we have uh, Jessica Ramos saying hey, go Jessica. Rashmi. Thanks, friend. <laughs> And then we also have Mr. Bashar saying hello, Attorney Rushni. Hello, Mr. So, Mr. Bashar. So uh, yes, uh, you know you're you're doing great. You've got some fans and uh, followers already. So great job. <laughs> uh, and now tell us how was it when you made that transition? Like I'm sure. So I've told you this. I've been to Gujarat. Uh, I've been to Baruda in India. I went a couple of years ago. We have many clients that do EB-5 investor clients in the um, investor visas in the United States. So mm -hmm. one of my clients whose case was completely successful now has a green card. He told me, hey, Naif, uh, there's a lot of people here in Gujarat that want you to come and do a presentation. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to call me twice to get on a plane. And I went and we met so many wonderful people. And I did a presentation, you know, we've even done two or three more EB-5s from that from that visit. So it's uh, really important that people know the difference and, and maintain contact. But like, what would you say was the starkest difference between being in Gujarat where everybody knows everybody and then being mm -hmm. dropped in London? Uh, was that it was, any different? Uh, it, was, it was difficult, the culture, the tradition, and, um, you, you know, like leaving, leaving your friends behind, leaving your life, that the only life that you know, um, leaving that behind and then coming to UK and start everything all over again. Um, it was difficult, and, um, but difficult and exciting at the same time. Because uh, then again, it's like a little fish from the pond is in a big lake kind of thing. So, um, and then I started my schooling. Um, I started with uh, my A-levels um, in, in United Kingdom, in London. Um, I used to go to a Hindi, Hindu school. Um, it was a, a Swaminarayan school. Um, everybody knows about this big uh, Hindu temple uh, in, in London, Neesden. So I went to a Hindu school. I finished my, my A-levels over there. So I was kind of like in the, in the needed um, Indian uh, culture over there in, the, in, in the England as well. Okay like a transitional place for, for you to be in London and but maintain all of your um, your connections and, and cultures and, and religions there. So we have more more comments. I just want to share on our screen here. Indian adult Kisa is I don't know if that means something. <laughs> uh, or that might be a typo. Uh, and then also here is just some, Mr. Muhammad telling us about, you know, India's wonderful first civilization uh, and good people. So thank you for that feedback. Uh, now, what made you after completing your A-levels in, in London want to go to the university or to become an, a solicitor in um, the UK? So, so you wouldn't believe if I tell you that I actually didn't want to be, uh, didn't want to be a, a lawyer, a solicitor in the United Kingdom. I actually wanted to be a dentist. Um, but I think the transition, the transition um, from India to UK, um, I, I missed on a couple of grades. And at that time, my dad already had a firm. He was a solicitor um, in the UK. So if you don't know, my dad is a solicitor. My dad was a solicitor. My brother is a solicitor. And now I became a solicitor. So the whole family um, is lawyers except my mom. So imagine oh, how God. much arguments go around back and forth in our house. Yeah, so I'm sure everybody's always right, you know, in that <laughs> position. And so you didn't become a dentist. Uh, you became a solicitor. Can you explain? Uh, you you helped educate me. You told me that in, in the UK that there's a solicitor and barrister. There's two mm -hmm. different types. You know, one deals with the attorneys. Can you give our viewers some of that um, definition to show how it compares with the US? Sure. So um, as I mentioned, after A-levels, I went and did my uh, bachelor's of law degree uh, at the Middlesex University. So after that degree, um, I then have to choose whether I want to become a solicitor or a barrister. Now, the difference is solicitors are more just like how we are. Um, there's a more client one on one interactions. Clients come to you with their problems and you try to resolve them. And 
barristers are more towards the advocacy um, part. Um, they go and represent um, clients in front of a judge. Um, and then you, a solicitor can also hire a barrister to go on their behalf. So um, as my dad already had a law firm and um, that's, that's, that's the path that I chose. Um, so I did a one year course um, to become a solicitor, two years of training. Um, we have to get a training contract to be able to uh, get admitted into the Law Society of England and Wales. So I did my training and then I became um, a solicitor. And what type of cases did your family's firm or does your family's firm handle? In, so, uh, back home in the so my family law firm was uh, called is called Robbins Romani and Co Solicitors, and my dad initially started the firm um, practicing immigration. Um, so we initially he started uh, doing immigration uh, cases, uh, spouse visas, business visas, uh, human rights petitions, um, etc. And then we slowly branched into personal injury. And now we also have a conveyancing department. So we have another attorney with us who also deals with um, real estate, residential, commercial um, transactions. So you guys did immigration and uh, personal injury. Uh, that sounds very familiar. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> I think you found a right fit here, uh, another family uh, to join. Uh, so I'm curious, what is it like for an immigrant trying to go to the UK, you know, either through a spouse, right? And, and how does that differ from the spouse visa here? You know, here in the US, if you're applying for your spouse, you could do consular processing or you could do adjustment of status. There are some requirements like proving a bona fide relationship, the affidavit of support. Um, and, you know, so what what how does that differ with your, um, you know, experience back in London? So so some of the things are very common. Uh, some of the requirements are very common, such as there has to be a marriage. Uh, there has to be a genuine relationship. Um, there has to be an accommodation requirement, such as the spouse, uh, the overseas spouse, if he's coming to the UK, then the UK citizen spouse has to be able to provide them and accommodate them. But the main uh, differences that we have uh, from US and UK uh, spouse visa immigration um, is that there's a requirement, there's a cap for the salary. So the UK spouse has to um, earn at least 18,600 um, pounds per annum. Uh, if they don't earn that, then they have to get a co-sponsor. And the second requirement is an English language requirement. So the, the overseas spouse that's coming to the UK has to has to meet some specific English uh, standard requirement by the UK government. So if you don't pass and if you don't meet that requirement, you cannot you cannot come to the UK. And um, okay. so what once so <laughs> a little bit different than here, right? Because here you don't have to demonstrate proficiency of English until you're becoming a citizen. So in the UK, in order to immigrate and, uh, you know, become a resident there, you do have to demonstrate English. Now, how how difficult is that English portion uh, or how, how is that conducted? Uh, how do they test yeah. that? So there are a couple of tests. Um, it's a government approved test uh, such as um, ILETS and TOEFL. So um, the, the spouse would know, the spouse overseas spouse would know which classes to go to. And um, it's on the on the government's website, um, the recommended courses. Okay. And now you obviously were not born in the U.S., so you are an immigrant uh, to our country. Uh, what was that process like for you? So I also, I as I was a solicitor and um, I life, as life turns out to be, I actually got married to my husband who's, who's located in the U.S. And it was either him or me. Uh, somebody had to move. And he he already had um, done a lot in the U.S., so it was time for me to to move to the U.S. And I, as a solicitor, I thought that I could at least do my research, um, and then I started uh, looking at resources, um, buying a couple of books to know what immigration U.S. immigration is about. Um, as a lawyer myself as well, I actually went ahead and got a consultation from an immigration attorney in the UK just okay. to see what, what my avenues were. Do I come on fiance visa? Do I want to, you know, apply for a spouse visa? How long does it does the process last? And then uh, finally, I decided to do the petition myself. Um, so I actually did my whole um, I-130 by myself, um, but I was here um, and then adjusted my status. Okay. And now is... I guess that's probably what led you to want to become an attorney in the U.S. Because, uh, you know, I just think about people who 
never stop going to school. Are, is that something, are you going to become a dentist next or, or what oh, do you no. have? What was uh, the reason behind well, that? So um, I think when, when we were when we were planning to get married, um, my, it was actually my husband who, who said that, you know, um, you are already a solicitor, you're already a successful a lawyer back in your country. And I, I wouldn't want you to be get let it all go away to waste and he was like if you're happy if you're willing to go and study for three more years and I'm, I'm i'm ready too so i think that was before even got married um as i was telling you that you know i was in india planning for my wedding and i was actually uh assigned uh, submitting applications to uh you know for law schools so that was already the plan i was uh, i was going to go to law school eventually when i moved to us okay. and I how wanted to keep that, i wanted to keep that passion alive and what would um, you say now that you've been working in immigration, you've been exposed to it, what would you say are some of the processes that you uh, enjoy and that you're currently working on in our office? I, I think I, I really enjoy um, doing spouse visas right now. And the reason why I want, I want to tell you that I feel like each and every case is very personal to me because I've been through that process. I've been through that interview process. I know the anxiety that you get when you're sitting in that USCIS yeah. interview and waiting for your number to be called. Um, so so I, I and and with me, I knew my case was 100 percent there and I knew it was going to get approved. But there was still that that one percent chance. Yeah. That, you know that something could go wrong right. you so, can see it all the time yeah people who mm -hmm. have kids you've been married years three four kids and they're so nervous it's because that unknown and, and being put under that kind of microscope is a lot of pressure so it's it's amazing to have an attorney who who knows that process and who can understand what it is exactly you're going through because you've been through it yourself correct and um i think i think there's also the part where we got to make sure that, you know, the client has evidence, they have bona fides, um, we have to vet the clients, you got to make sure the marriage is not of uh, convenience, there's no fraud involved. So I, I am I, I like and I, what I want is to make sure that the my clients feel comfortable, they're prepared when they go for the interview. Um, and yeah, so I enjoy doing spouse visas right now. Okay. I want and to make sure the process is as smooth as possible for them. And um as far as our firm goes, uh, what would you say is something that's more different than working back in the UK? Uh, what would you say is one of the biggest differences with a US law firm and, and, a, and a firm like yours back in London? So, so my firm is, our firm was kind of similar to, to what you have. It, it's, it's a family firm. The main difference is that I was working with family. So we were we were working when we went went home. We were still working here. Um, but I think the type of type of work that we do, the petitions, um, your the the US is a very set format. Um, while in the UK there was not set format like we used to go. Um, how how do I put it? Like it was it was my own firm. So I could I was working till late night. Um, petitions wise, clients wise, it's it's a little bit different. Uh, law is different everywhere in the world but it's, it's a similar process okay and what is your favorite thing about our office i didn't tell you the question ahead of time the, the team the i i like i like the team i like how we all work together um everything is organized everyone is very nice um especially uh we have a lot of languages in the office which is a, a which is a very good asset uh we have some you guys speak arabic we have portuguese we have spanish and now i speak hindi i speak gujarati yeah. tell me about that so you speak hindi gujarati and i saw on your resume and i didn't see it during the interview process that you have a little bit of spanish on there so i didn't know that so now i'm going to test you uh not right on the live and we're going to speak spanish <laughs> There's no way that's happening. I can I can make you speak in Gujarati because you've been to Baroda, right? So yeah, it should be exactly. easier for you. So a good friend and a very knowledgeable immigration attorney in town, uh, Ms. Paturi has said, welcome, go Indians, and uh, said that you had a great lawyer to work with. And thank you for that comment. Uh, attorney Paturi uh, is very experienced in knowledge and thanks for joining us tonight. I love Thank to see my you. colleagues. And you know, one thing that's great about immigration law practice is your peers in this field 
everybody seems to be so helpful. Like it's less of a competition mindset and people continue to work together because we are in the greater good of helping people. And I think uh, people understand that in our field, especially after the last few years, things have were extremely difficult. Now, besides immigration, you mentioned you did have PI at your job in London. And Correct. And you even had PI exposure here. Mm -hmm. we, had, we have car accidents and personal injury in our firm. Mm -hmm. What is it if there's a favorite part uh, of personal injury cases and car accidents, do you think uh, it really speaks to you? Um, I believe the, the moment that I get the client's medicals back um, is ascertaining. I think it's very important and some of the attorneys really miss, miss that, that you have to make sure that there is a, um, how, do I, how do I put it, that you have to, when you analyze how much, how much the claim is worth, you have to be very honest to your clients. I think yeah. that's very important. You have to meet their expectations. You have to manage their expectations. I like to go through the medical records with, along with my client. I have to tell them the pros and cons of their cases. And then I, at every single opportunity, I always ask my client's approval before I negotiate the offer with them. Of course, sometimes you have to make that decision and it's it's okay um, to go on with, you know, what you, what you feel is right. Um, however, I, I really, really believe that, you know, we have to make sure that the client is updated and kept in the loop the whole process. I mean, by, by, you know, legally speaking, we must notify the client. And of course, the client can give us a bottom line, which would allow us to accept anything above that number. But, you know, I think you hit it on the head, like having honest expectations about car accidents. Everybody sees these billboards that say millions of dollars in recovery, but they don't realize, you know, that came with a price. That mm -hmm. was some kind of catastrophic loss, death, or loss of a limb, something that is really, you know, I, I wouldn't wish on anybody. And it all depends on, of course, insurance coverage. So, and we say this all the time on our Facebook lives, Florida does not require bodily injury insurance. So if you're injured in an accident and the other person doesn't have bodily injury insurance and you don't have uninsured motorist insurance, then you're gonna be stuck with bills if you have severe injuries or you're not gonna be able to treat. So I tell everybody, please uh, get uninsured motorist insurance until Florida becomes a state that requires that bodily injury. Um, Rushni, you mentioned a couple of things about you know, being a, a, a solicitor in London and then as well as here. Now I'll just put you on the spot. Which one do you prefer? Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, I'm licensed in both the countries right now. So, hey, <laughs> um, I, I, do, I do love U.S. Uh, immigration. I think there's a variety on, and various branches that a person can uh, apply under. Um, so it's, it's like maybe if you're a victim of crime, that's a U visa for you and there's a VAWA there for you. There's a spouse visa. Uh, a family can petition for you. Uh, which is which is great. Uh, brother can petition for you. So I, I think there's a different avenues. Um, so I, I kind of prefer U.S. immigration right now. And we I was curious because the U.S. tends to have some strict laws and not uh, a lot of options for humanitarian. Mm -hmm. What is the U.K.'s or the EU? You know, the, they, they left in you, right? So they uh, yeah. Brexit. And what, what is the U.K.'s position on um on immigration and humanitarian relief like so, so yeah so well it's it's very very different and i i really found that very interesting that in the in the u.s um if a child is born in the u.s and the parents have overstayed or they have no status the the child cannot petition for them until he is 21 years old 20, 21 years of age um but in the uk um the human rights if you apply under the human rights if the child is born in the uk and is seven years of age um, that, and if you show hardship, um, such as the one that we do in the U.S. for a 601 waiver, you have to show hardship to the child that, you know, the child has medical condition. The child has never been to abroad, like never been to their home country. He doesn't know the language. He doesn't speak the language. He has medical issues. He goes to school. His life is in the U.K. The parents can actually petition on behalf of the child and get leave to remain, uh, right. which, is, which is very interesting. And I think sometime I, I i hope that in the u.s there there is a, a law that passes or something mm -hmm. happens that you know even in some of the u.s laws uh the children are not qualifying relatives 
for the provisional waiver. So a lot of times we can't even apply for a pardon or forgiveness because the children don't count uh, as a qualifying relative for a waiver, which is kind of crazy. And I can't tell you, I mean, if I had a, a penny, not a dollar for every time somebody asks me, well, I have a US citizen child and I've been here 10 years, don't I get something? I'm like, no, you know, and then you all have in, in London, a procedure that you just mentioned that after seven years of residence and things that you would be eligible if there is hardship. So right. I think it's interesting that there is some type of humanitarian aspect that's greater um, with, uh, with the UK. Now, how is their employment side? I know we have a few minutes left, but what's the employment visa side? Uh, did you have a lot of experience in that or do they I, have- I didn't, uh, but my brother used to do the, um, and he still used to do um, the employment visa side. So he okay. was more, but, um, so it would be um, similar to the H-1B, but then you have to, again, for labor of certification, they had an online portal when you have to apply for the employee. And once you get the approval, then you can, but it was, it was a tier base. It's a points-based system over there as well. So say, for example, if you have a master's degree, you get 30 points for it. If you meet a financial requirement by the employer, you meet 50. So you have to kind of like meet that Do requirement. Need, that point system, does it require an employer job offer still, or is it just simply your accolades? Simply your accolades. So you can go, if I have my law degree, I have experience, and I say, I want to immigrate if there, they'll meet, check the points. If you meet your requirements and then the know, If your yeah. brother is hiring, maybe I can <laughs> make a transfer. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Before we go, I just want to give a quick update. Uh, we spoke about it last week in the Facebook Live in Arabic. Last year, any application filed December 1st and after for naturalization was going to receive a new exam, a more difficult exam out of 128 questions instead of 100 questions. The Biden administration has now taken away this exam. So if you filed from December 1st to March 1st, you will have the option to take either naturalization exam. So if you've already started studying the new harder one and you don't want to change courses, you don't have to. But anybody who files after March 1st is going to be taking the 2007 or 8 exam that's been around for some time. So that's like a really important update I wanted to share with you all. Roshni, anything else you want to share with everybody tonight? No, that's it. If you guys have any questions, uh, do let us know. Um, email us, contact us, and we are there for you. Yeah, and we just sent out our, our monthly newsletter for March. Happy Women's Month. Uh, and, you know, be on the lookout for that. If you want to subscribe to that newsletter, you could just email me or message me the your email address and we will add you to that newsletter and you get to see, you know, cases of the month and successful things that have happened and updates. So, uh, Attorney Ravani, thank you for joining Mubarak Law. Thank you for your first Facebook Live with me. I, I look forward to having you do this, you know, maybe next week on your own and I'll take the night off and uh, maybe, maybe we can even have it in Hindi. Uh, we should have a episode in Hindi or in Gujarati. I think that mm -hmm. would serve uh, your community well, uh, especially to hear, uh, you know, there, it's always nice to hear your own language. Uh, so I hope that we can do that soon. Perfect. Looking forward to Thanks, it. Everybody. Thanks everybody who joined us tonight and all the feedback and welcoming back. We'll see you guys next week. Okay.